welcome to another episode of My Pretend TV Show. My name is Nana Nadal. For today, I've invited the Managing Director of Lifeline 16911 Ambulance, Michael Deakin. Hi, Michael. Hi, Nana. How are you? Um, good, good. Thank you for accommodating my invitation. I know these are crazy times for you. Um, I really didn't want to bother you, but then um, the urge to share what you do was stronger. <laughs> so I, I nod and nod you. Thank you for saying yes. No problem. My pleasure. Happy to be of service. Okay. So um, Lifeline 16911 Ambulance has been around for 21 years. Is 25. That 25 years. Are 25 years. Yeah. Wow, okay, 25. And your main service is, well, I call it saving lives, but um, you provide emergency medical response. Is that it? Yeah. Through, we call it uh, emergency quick response. Emergency quick response through your ambulances. That's and, right. Um, you have how many of these ambulances? We have 65 ambulances, first responders, and support vehicles spread across uh, Metro Manila. Okay, so these are in Metro Manila. What about other areas? Not yet. Uh, we're, we're not yet even scratching the surface of Metro Manila. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with about 12 million people, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of accidents that happen on a daily basis. Yeah. Okay, so these ambulances, um, I just want to share, you know, the first time ever that we called an ambulance was about more than a decade ago. It was when my dad had a stroke. And, you know, I just called an ambulance off the yellow pages, I think, I don't even remember. And what we got was a van with reconfigured seats and the siren and lights, you know, the wang wang. <laughs> um, and, you know, we thought that was how it really was. Um, but then we had to call an ambulance again. And this time um, we called Lifeline. And it was my brother who rode in the ambulance with my dad, and he recalls exclaiming, "Literally, wow!" When we hopped, when we he hopped into the into your van, so it was really, really different. And that's when we discovered that um, that reconfigured van is not uh, an ambulance, <laughs> <laughs> and um, we can get something better. If I remember right, the price wasn't even that far. I think it was it just cost the same. So right. a lot of people are not aware of this, are not aware of how special Lifeline's vans are. So can you tell us more about your ambulances? Well, okay. Um, tw going back 25 years ago, uh, the decision was made that we would only deploy, deploy uh, what's a proper international ambulance. Okay. Now, the, the, we have to go back to the definition. Ambulance is not a, it's a French word, means walking hospital, mm -hmm. uh, developed by Napoleon. And um, if, you, if you take the word literally, you, you're bringing the emergency room or the hospital to the patient. Okay. And yeah. in the Philippines, um, there is no, or there was no law or rule with the word ambulance. And it took lifeline almost 15 years of lobbying and pushing with the Department of Health to get the word ambulance properly defined. Mm -hmm. So only as of three years ago, um, the word ambulance must comply to what is in international standards, which is basically the lifeline ambulance. Um, up to that point, anything with a van and a wang wang, like you said, people were calling ambulances. Now it's actually against the, uh, it, the Department of Health will close you down and uh, fine you for using the word ambulance without having the proper equipment and personnel on board. That's good. <laughs> Finally, it only took 15 years. <laughs> Prior to that, Lifeline was already running proper ambulances. We, ever since day one, we've always run proper ambulances, which is why Lifeline has always sold membership you know, to the people that appreciate what exactly they're getting. So we built our corporate market, our individuals such as yourself and your families uh, who have joined the Lifeline membership in order for us to be able to respond using the best uh, equipment, best training, and best supplies that are applicable in today's EMS. Without that, you take the risk of just getting any van. But you 
are open to the public. Anybody can call you and you will respond to anyone or you only respond to members. Our priority is always members. Uh, because of the demand and the nature of what we do, which is saving, help saving lives, uh, we have to respond also to the public. But they, it is expensive and the priority is always given to members. So in the last, let's say, three years, our average emergency responses per day is at 100 to 120 a day. Wow. That's life and death. That's a lot. That's a That's lot. That's a lot. So if you're not a member, um, the priority will be given always to our members. That's what they have paid in advance for. Right. I have been a member since 2009. I nice. Think. Thank yeah. you. And every time I renew my membership, you <laughs> You sent me this magnet with yes. your numbers, right? And so I have so many of these. <laughs> I copied the refrigerator. There's one beside every phone in the household. Good. I even have one in my car, you know, just in case there's an accident. I, you know, at least I have this in the car, whether it's me calling or whoever finds me, hopefully will call your number. Um, can you talk about the membership plans? Because I know there's the individual, which I have signed up for, and um, some of my family members are also members. And, you know, I've given this away as a gift. Good. Good. Mem That's yeah. Membership to Lifeline, I've given it away, not necessarily to my peers, but some of them have parents mm -hmm. who are left at home with a caregiver or a yaya, and they don't have a car there or a driver. So, yeah, I've given Lifeline membership as a gift. What are the different categories? Okay, the, the different categories we have with membership is the individual. That's the uh, uh, single person that wants to get covered. Mm -hmm. A family up to 10 people, including their kasambahais and guests in their home. Uh, and then the, the next uh, shift is for corporate memberships. Uh, our biggest is what we call site and safety zone memberships. So right now, Lifeline covers uh, about just over 5 million people in Metro Manila using 350 different contract, membership contracts. Mm -hmm. So the South Expressway, the Skyway, the South Expressway down to Batangas is covered by Lifeline, covering about 300,000 people a day. The cities such as uh, BGC, Philinvest, Rockwell are all covered by Lifeline. When it's covered by Lifeline, that means everybody in that zone or in that area is covered with no questions asked. It's paid for by somebody else. And that's allowed us to increase it from the individual and family up to the corporate level, which covers us the mass, I guess the, the greatest number of reach, which is our objective to save as many lives as we can or extend as many lives as we can until they get proper help in the hospital. I see um, signages in some villages. So yes, that, yeah, okay. So that means you cover the village also. Yes, if you if you enter a village and it's in a lifeline zone, that means everybody inside that village is covered. The the homeowners, the guests, the staff, but the Madanaka covered in. And that applies also for the family package, for the household package, right? Th that's you right. Who enters that house? Is that yes. how it is? We designed that one because it was um some people would get I guess confused or they would be budget conscious and they would try to just limit it to their family but we forget and uh, uh, that our household is part of the family the kasambahais the drivers you know and if an accident happens to them what, what are you going to do not call lifeline call somebody else because it's cheaper we decided to just cover everybody yeah. you know, in the household as long as it happens in the house you know, in, in it, the area that you go that's right Okay. So by zoning the area, it becomes more cost effective for the person who's covering that. If you're covering everybody across Metro Manila, it becomes very expensive for whoever's paying. Yeah. So schools, for instance, uh, it's a school within the school grounds only, you know, on the highways, just within the highways, um, in, in the corporate cities like Philinvest and Rockwell and um, BGC, just within that area. Then we do apartments. So if your apartment is covered everybody inside that building is now covered okay okay so as a member what mm -hmm. do i get you get the unlimited are, free use sorry the memberships are annual right yes the membership's annual okay so again uh, as a member what do i get 
Okay, you get free use of the ambulance, all of its, all the equipment and supplies needed for what you to be brought to the emergency. Are these? What equipment? Yeah. Okay, for everything from if you're having a heart attack, it's the defibrillators, you know, the ECGs that are needed, the mon patient monitors, the oxygen, the epinephrine that's that's used to, to restart your your um, your or open up your your blood supplies. It's all of the life-saving equipment and supplies that can become very expensive. And if you start to cost cut at the level of the emergency, you start to make mistakes. So that's why all the lifeline crew are trained to just use whatever is needed to save and help save that person's life. And for the member, it's everything that we need to use is also part of the package. It just eliminates all of the extras. I always hated the way in the Philippines we tend to itemize everything. So you get a hospital bill that's like a yellow pages. It's just full of every item there. Yeah. We just decided to package it to make it simple. Now, what's free is the endorsement, the, the response, uh, the, the stabilization and the transport of the patient or the member to the hospital, nearest hospital if they have no choice or hospital mm -hmm. of choice. And that's endorsed to the emergency room. That's unlimited. Okay. And... Um you have a team in the ambulance. A yes. standard team would be comprised of how many people? In all of our ambulances, uh, there has to be a three-man team or three-person team in, okay. on board. That's the driver EMT. An EMT is an emergency medical technician. But it's not just a regular driver. No, 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 no. They have to be trained. The training for an EMT is two months uh, in the classroom and, uh, and then 250 hours on the field to become a basic emergency medical technician. Okay. Then there's the driver and a registered nurse. Uh, the registered nurse is uh, required under the Department of Health to be able to do things like uh, insert an IV or intravenous um, uh, to open up your, your veins, um, to allow the, the doctor to give or, or instructions over the radio or telephone to the crew. So right now that has to be a registered nurse only doing that. Okay. All of our nurses are also trained as emergency medical technicians. Mm -hmm. In some areas, um, especially in our hospital-based ambulances, there are doctors that are full-time on board the ambulance. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So that is the reason why it's expensive. A lot of people, I've seen a lot of people post on Facebook complaining, you know, they needed an ambulance, they called Lifeline, they weren't members. That's why it's expensive. Right. They're not members. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and we, don't, we don't apologize for that. It is expensive. Yes. So they, they uh, I, I've seen some people complaining, saying, oh, the hospital is just four kilometers away or six kilometers away, and they're uh, charging us so much. Um, I think in their minds, they're computing based on taxi rates. They don't understand that there are a lot of experts on board. Um, like you said, you don't even just have an ordinary driver. Even your driver is trained. And then you've got all these equipment that are supposed to save lives. Um, I mean, if I'm going to be stuck on the road, I want to be stuck on the road with some equipment that can treat me, right? That's right. That's <laughs> so, right. Yeah, so, so, so that's the reason why it's not taxi rate. It's not four kilometers. It's not at all. A flat down, what is that? How do you want it? Yeah. To get to save one person, um, it involves the, the efforts of nine full-time people. Okay. And these nine full-time people are spread between the ambulance, which has three, the central dispatch, which is the 16911, the hotline, uh, that handles the case when you call. They first uh, establish who you are, what's, what's required, where you are, and then dispatch the nearest available ambulances. We always dispatch two because one might break down for one, and two, it's a counter flow to the traffic. So sometimes the furthest ambulance is actually the fastest ambulance to get to you, but that's determined by the central dispatch. Okay. Um, and then there's the hospital uh, admission team, or the, the, the team that's waiting to accept you inside the ER. Without that, that uh, system in place, you'll get stuck at the ER. You know, we've all experienced not using an ambulance, but going to the emergency room and waiting for hours and hours to get service. That's because the lack of triage prior to you arriving. Mm -hmm. The more information that's given, the more that the hospital can prepare before you even arrive, the faster the service when you do arrive. 
And when in life and death, we're counting minutes and seconds. So many people have argued that oh, I have a car and driver. Go ahead. You know, there's nothing that will be done the minutes it's taking you to get to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that's 15 minutes. And then when you get to the hospital, the whole triage begins there. And that can take an hour. Yeah. You're still not getting serviced. You know, so what you're paying for is that entire system that's dedicated to helping save your life. And for that, that comes at a very high cost. Unless, of course, you remember, which then it's free. But my life is worth more than all that. <laughs> so. But yes, you do. You, it, it's definitely worth more, to, you know. And um, people do complain. It's unfortunate, but that's anywhere in the world. It's the same. Mm -hmm. okay. So since you mentioned that, I've seen a lot of issues um, about people having a problem finding hospitals to go to because the, they suspect they have COVID or they actually have COVID um, and the hospitals are full and they cannot be accommodated. So if they're brought to the hospital um, in a lifeline ambulance, will that be easier? Under the COVID, uh, cur the current pandemic, uh, nothing is easy. You know? So triage is done very, very strictly and we have to adhere to the, the hospital requirements. Mm -hmm. So many times when people have called Lifeline to be brought to the hospital, there is no room or um, in, in any of the hospitals, especially in the early days. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no point bringing you to the hospital if all it is is going to be an hour later you're turned away because your symptoms did not actually meet the requirements for admission. Okay. Uh, we understand that there's panic, we understand there's fear. That's where Lifeline has managed to help a lot by, by one, going through the process with the caller and two, handling it at home. You know, okay. again, if you can't or you're not qualified to be brought to the hospital right. because you're, you may be having the symptoms, but it's, it's mild, moderate or severe. Mild and moderate are the last priority. It's the severe that their hospitals were looking at. That's the whole concept of flattening the curve. You know, but with Lifeline, for the, at least for our members and the ones who have called us, the non-members, we've managed to service them at home first, show them how to isolate, show them what to do while waiting for the hospital rooms to become available. And many have still not become available. How has this pandemic changed your operations? Like you've added that now. There's such a thing as addressing these people who think they have COVID, um, but uh, in terms of how do you prevent contamination? How do you protect your staff? Okay, that's a good, that's a very good question. Um, we've been lucky in Lifeline over the 25 years because we've gone through quite a bit. Um, we've always have drills in regards to disaster preparedness, whether that be nature, natural or man-made disasters. And um, so we've always had protocols in place, for instance, for the, the, the big one, the earthquake. So when this pandemic happened, we just adopted the earthquake protocols into the pandemic protocols. The difference only with regards to the response was the, instead of going into search and rescue, it was into decontamination and protection. So what did change? Um, our average response time in Metro Manila is about 12 minutes. And that's 100, 120 runs that we do in a day. We do that because the way we position our ambulances across the, uh, across the city allows us to be able to respond at the fastest possible time. What changed when the, when the pandemic hit and the lockdown started was the preparation of the ambulances for decontamination, protection of the crew and protection of the patient we're about to pick up. <coughs> in that one, it took um, 30 minutes for instance, one in some cases for us to prepare the ambulance with the plastic linings and the, uh, the decontamination protocols in preparation of receiving a patient that is now COVID. And then you have to prep the patient. Then you rush to the hospital, the patient is admitted, you know, although there's a, a, a wait time you know, for the ambulance because of the preparation and the receiving in the hospital. But then it would take us four hours to decontaminate that ambulance wow. onto the next one. That's using the, the protocols of UV technology yeah. and the four, the four clean policy that we have in regards to ambulance decontamination. 
So immediately we went into um, our secondary or our, our tertiary plans, you know, in our in our protocols, which was to get the, the most expensive and the most reliable decontamination dry mister available. Mm -hmm. Dry misters are used only primarily in the OR, ER, ICU units of hospitals. We procured one, which was the last one available in the country at the time. It's from Switzerland. And we procured that one to bring down the decontamination down to 33 minutes. Well, from four hours. From four hours to 33 minutes and more effective in regards to the way the technology is, uh, uh, attacks the virus. But more importantly, because it's dry, it doesn't affect the electricals on board the ambulance, the equipment. Um, so it becomes very fast for us to deploy and very, very safe for the crew and for the patient that, that we are now responding to. And then the, the um, post-mortem after we've done the run is the decontamination of the unit is also just as important. So it's, it's a two-way uh, disinfection before we respond and after we respond. And that brought down within a couple of days, it had brought down a response back again to the, yeah. the 12, 13 minute response time. But it did not help with the hospitals regarding the acceptance of the patients. They just were overwhelmed, yeah. especially in the first month, the six weeks of the, of the pandemic. Yeah. Now it's starting to get a little better. They've got COVID centers. Uh, the government's done what they can in regards to quarantine centers, which has helped. So we have other places to take the, uh, the patients. The patients. And you mentioned earlier when we were talking off air that you treat every patient as a COVID positive person, right? Well, when you accept or when you accommodate the patient in your ambulance. Unfortunately, we've seen how uh, uh, patients lie. Um, people lie, you know, and we saw that in the early days of the pandemic. And um, because we've experienced, COVID, uh, we've experienced SARS, we've experienced MERVs, we've experienced e Ebola, you know, we had those protocols already in place. So it was quick for us to react. Mm -hmm. you know? So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, 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 we have to treat every patient has COVID positive. Uh, PPE and all of our staff and there was a shortage as you know in the in the country for PPE so again we went in back to our protocols and went into our secondary uh, redundancy plans which was to make our own so as soon as the, the it became clear that the PPEs were in shortfall we started to manufacture immediately our own PPE wow. we also started to have um, our secondary plans for the making of alcohol because the alcohol ran out also in the country, the supply. Yeah. And alcohol, for instance, the, the difference between making gin and rubbing alcohol is a matter of degrees in distilling. Mm -hmm. And we had that. So we just approached wow. the distillers that could help us and we immediately had barrels of alcohol uh, available to us. PPEs, the same thing. It went from disposable to reusable, but the decontamination was very important. So all of those things have to be in place for the system to work without breaking. And again, we were lucky because we've been around for 25 years and always revisit our protocols. You know, they're not there for decoration. They're, they're there for a reason. And uh, they have to be practiced, you know, right. whether there's a pandemic or not. You move very fast and you're always like a step or several steps ahead. It's the only way to, to help save lives. Um, you know, if you're not ahead of the game and if you're not thinking ahead, uh, EMS, Emergency Medical Services, is adapting to the situation in very extreme circumstances. It's different from uh, doing a, a procedure in the emergency room. We have to do this now under a car wreck. There's a fire, there's an earthquake, um, somebody's stuck in a tree being electrocuted. You have to think very quickly and work out many different scenarios. So we do that. We have a full-time training academy that just continuously trains and trains staff. Unfortunately for us, because we train them so well, they also fly out of the country and are exported uh, <laughs> all over the world. So, yeah. but again, that's something that we have to just continue to address and continue to do better every time. Right, right. Um, okay, uh, you mentioned the dry misting. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think I saw on your Facebook that you're offering this as a service to your clients to uh, decontaminate their office spaces or homes. Is that right? Yes. Uh, it was made available to our members and some non-members. Uh, when the decontamination was not in use uh, for our ambulances, which will always take priority, uh, the decontamination services were offered to um, members, members' homes and, um, and offices. So that's been a very good, um, steady, um, we've had to deploy a, a rapid de- decontamination team that's activated 24 hours a day. All they do is go to either the offices' homes and priority again is our ambulances after every use. So they're just running around Metro Manila, okay. 24 hours a day. Okay. What other services um, does Lifeline provide? Do you still provide those um, like home service of diagnostics and uh, doctors on call? Do you still have them? Yes, in fact, um, we would average uh, a good a good revenue stream and a good, a good service stream for uh, doctors on call 24 hours a day or nurses on call 24 hours a day uh, for our members. But since COVID, um, most people are scared to go to the hospital and, uh, and don't want to go. So we've had to ramp up uh, okay. very quickly our services on the home care side. Okay. So we increase services of what we can do, not just consultations, but we can do minor minor surgery. Um, a lot of procedures in regards that can be done in an urgent care clinic. We've now taken and able to do it at your home or office. Okay. Wow. Uh, diagnostics as well is uh, 24 hours a day. The only difference is that you have to fast in some cases, uh, yeah. 10 to 12 hours. You know. Mm-hmm. So uh, as long as you follow the fasting rules, we'll be there and pick it up. Okay. So and we believe that the new normal will be more of that. Right, right. So we've already started the procurement of um, portable ultrasounds, uh, portable x-rays, all of these things which will start coming in and we'll start offering it to our members precisely so we can do it at their home. That's great because yeah. um, I just saw some Instagram posts a couple of days ago of some pregnant women complaining that they haven't had their checkups in months. Right. Because they're afraid to go to the hospitals or even their doctors are not advising them to go to the hospital. So it's good to know that you have this um, and that even minor procedures can be done at home. Yes. Um, and I, how long does it take? Like if I call today, how many days or hours before you can send a doctor? If you want it very fast, uh, there's a premium price or what we call a stat price. Um, that's at 3,000 pesos. Within 30 minutes, you'll have a doctor in your house. Uh, it gets cheaper the longer you're able to wait. So within eight hours, it drops down, and uh, okay. within 24 hours, so you call tonight and you want the booking for tomorrow morning, you know, the price goes down accordingly. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just allows us to be able to move the doctors and the ambulances uh, around. Sorry, let me, let me correct that. We don't use ambulances for doctors on call and uh, to go to your home or office. Okay. It tends to um, uh, cause alarm to the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Many of them have said, nakakahiya sa kapitbahay, naka home care lang. So we, we deploy red, little red cars we call Charlies. Our, mm-hmm. our ambulances are Alpha, our cars are Charlie, and our support vehicles, the pickups, are Sierra. Mm-hmm. So Alpha, Charlie, Sierra. And the Charlies are used, uh, little cute red cars that go to your home, okay. do the diagnostics, the doctors, and all that. Wow, okay. So, um, wait, I forgot to ask. Um, we talked about how you cover Metro Manila earlier. Yes. But uh, people who are out of town and need, um, how do you call that, to be airlifted, medical, mm. um, do you also provide that? We call it a, a medivac. Medivac, uh, yeah. a, medi- a medical evacuation. Yes, uh, yes we've, we've uh, always offered medical evacuation to, uh, to both members and non-members. It is very expensive. Um, so you're talking about, if we go to Palawan with a, with a jet, it costs about 600000 okay. uh, If it's a helicopter to Baguio, it's about one hundred and twenty to 150000 um, But if you're needing... Uh, an immediate air evacuation, it can be done. We average about 
last year we were averaging about 20 air flights for the year. And uh, prior years before that would hit as high as uh, 30 to 35 uh, flights per year all over the Philippines. Okay. So yeah, I had no doubt that it would be expensive, but it's good to know that That's it not, is possible. That doesn't come to us. Uh, that goes to the airlines, uh, yeah. the, the aircrafts. The gas is very expensive. But it's good to know that it's available and it's possible yes. to avail of yes. these things, right? Um, anything else that I missed? Anything else you offer or you'd like to announce? You know, um, I think people should add you or what you call like your page on Facebook because um, I've been seeing a lot of infographs. Um, mm. You have all these tips about um, protocols, right? Uh, yes. how, what to do when you have somebody who has COVID at home. How do you clean your shoes? Um, I have a list somewhere here, but now I cannot find it. Um, uh, guidelines to returning to work, stuff like that. So there are always very helpful and valuable information on your Facebook page, with it, which is um, at Lifeline 16911 on Facebook, right? Yes. And then where else can they find you? They can find us on the web, which is lifeline.com.ph. And... Um, it's really primarily Facebook and the, and the web where we do most of our marketing and, and uh, announcements. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up the protocols. Um, one thing that Lifeline has always tried to do is reduce the noise. And uh, as we've seen in this pandemic, there's a lot of armchair experts in everything. Uh, when the PPEs run out, everybody became an expert. When uh, now rapid testing is flavor of the week and uh, everybody's doing rapid testing and everybody has an opinion. Um, what we've always done is try to reduce the noise and just stick to basic facts. It's like what we do in EMS. Mm -hmm. In our job, uh, the bread and butter is the airway breathing circulation or the new protocol. With the new protocols, it's uh, circulation airway breathing. Either way, that's the bread and butter. Keep the circulation moving, keep the person breathing, you know, and without that, any other toy that we have is useless if we cannot stick to the basics. And the same thing comes with a pandemic. There was all kinds of claims and counterclaims and all that. At the end of the day, it's mask, social distancing, wash your hands. Just stick to the basics and you'll be okay. You know, of course, there's many, many things out there, but you will get confused and depressed in reading it. So all we've done is try to release that information and just... This is information we don't make up, by the way. We basically filter what's given by WHO, CDC, DOH. We take out the politics, we take out the, the fancy scientific words and descriptions and breakdowns and simplify it so it becomes human and adaptable. And that's all we've done. And we hope that we've made a difference in regards to how we treat, uh, how we reduce our protocols to the public so things like treating patients at home, there were no clear guidelines. And if they were, they were so much words and um, jargon that people couldn't make heads or tails of it and got more confused. All we did was simplify. Great. And you are doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, we measure things in minutes and seconds. Yeah. You know? So reading is one of them as well. We try to keep it simple so people can understand it very quickly. Returning to work, for instance, if you can post all the posters of wash your hands, but if you don't have the basins and the soap that's to provide your employees, then what's the point? Yeah. You know? So that's where we, we help with the protocols. This is the mixture. This is what you do. The decontamination is another one. Not everyone can afford a machine that's 800,000 pesos. Um, but there are other things that you can do, which is Lysol or Clorox and just use the proper ratio and use that in your homes, use that in your office. It's not rocket science. Okay. Um, aside from the information that you share on Facebook, do you do lectures about these things? Do you offer talks um, or go to offices and help them set things up? Not at this stage. Uh, we, we're just releasing the protocols. We'll not release anything that we don't do ourselves. Um, after this, that's where we will start with the, with the, um, I guess the lecture circuit again, like we did with SARS when it when it came out. 
um, or if this extends a little bit longer because our resources are stretched in regards to having to respond uh, daily. It's, we've, we've had no um, lockdown for Lifeline. It's been ramped up ever since the, the lockdown. This year, yeah. This year. And, you, and you have to set your priorities. And everything is so fluid. I mean, we can come up with advice today based on the best advice being out there. Yeah. But then tomorrow it changes. So it's uh, rather than keep on reinventing and confusing, reduce the noise, stick to the basics. Once proven, then we'll come out with the with all of the statements because that's where it'll help moving forward with any other pandemic. Yeah. No one saw this coming. I mean, in hindsight, everybody will say they did, but nobody saw this coming the way it did. And nobody expected the world to get locked down. Nobody expected to run out of PPEs, mm -hmm. uh, ventilators and all of these things. So now the lesson's been learned and hopefully that the world will be better prepared for the next one. But it's not a surprise that it's happened. You know, with SARS, it almost happened where it almost went worldwide. Yeah. It didn't, it managed to contain. There's a plateau at the end of the day. Mankind will survive this. It's just at what cost. Right, right. And uh, we have to do the right things and to follow the protocols so that we survive this. Yeah, that's why I don't know if social media is actually a help or a deterrent or a hindrance in I a pandemic. I think it depends on how much of social media you consume and what part of social media you follow and uh, focus on. There's a lot. There's a lot of BS out there. Yeah, it surprises me all the time when people make these claims. It's like, wow. No, no, no. We try to avoid that. <laughs> We try to avoid that and we stick to the Facebook page of Lifeline at Lifeline16911. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. And to all of you who watched us, please do yourselves a favor and sign up with Lifeline16911 Ambulance. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe and stay home. Thank you.